Dear colleagues, I'm Dikra Shaouch, and on behalf of Nouvelle Democracy, I would like to thank you so much for your participation. Many thanks also to Delphine Minchella to have accepted our invitation. Delphine is PhD in Management Science on the Organizational Speciality, Management Relationship. Her main work relates to workspace management, associated services and third places, and are generally based on applying research missions like Société Générale Action du Logement in France. Delphine is as a researcher in Métis Lab in École de Management in Normandy in France. Today, Delphine talked about flex office, hot desk, state of practices, pros and cons. Now I leave the floor to Cristiano Sebastiani, President of Renouveau Democracy, who will present our trade unions activities and the related policies. Thank you. Thank you, Dikra, uh, and thank you very much, Delphine, to have accepted our invitation. Um, <laughs> we will have three uh, very interesting conferences with her. Uh, we keep on trying to get the best possible expert during our negotiation work, uh, because we know that we must be assisted by the best expert if we want to succeed in the negotiation. Uh, we have to, to breach, actually, two different uh, scenarios on which we are not effective at all. The first one is to pretend ourselves to be competent on everything. It is not. Uh, the commission is considered to be a bloody technocracy, but sometimes we have the feeling that uh, when it comes to deal with human resources, we are more at the stage of uh, bricolage. That is not acceptable. Uh, our institution is so keen on looking at the best possible uh, <clears throat> management of the of the budget but when it comes to deal with the stuff that seems to be just a marginal and side effect and we we are really strong against it the second uh, paradox is to to consider that the commission itself is something totally with no link whatsoever with external words so we discuss we discuss flexibility open space flex offices as if we are the only ones in the world to discuss it and the fact that we are always late uh, has a side positive effect that we can rely on the previous experiences. Because if you are the front runner, you must invent the, the path yourself. But if you come always late, as is the case for us, you can have a sort of benchmark and to take into account the best possible uh, possibility. I was so interested in uh, waiting for the publication of the new article and or book of, of Delphine mentioning la lutte de place uh, étude de comportement des top managers pour maintenir leur privilège spatial uh, because it was exactly what we were facing in the commission when at the beginning the decision to switch from uh, individual offices to open space uh, was decided the first reaction of the manager was not for me just for the others. Uh, some managers uh, leading by example, as our, our commissioner is preaching, uh, has accepted to go on the same uh, path. Others have just managed to keep their own wonderful offices, uh, considering that it's deserved, considering that they need to have it because they deal with confidential files. I mean, we will see together and perhaps we can have a, a, a new conference when this article will be published uh, because we have been publishing ourselves uh, a very clear communication in this respect and i was called that my approach was totally not respectable enough how you can dare to imagine that a director general can be on open space it will be totally impossible but still, we have some director generals, uh, starting from the one of the human resources that is today on open space, sharing the same burden, the same destiny with their staff. That is a, a part on the culture of trust that the same commissioner is preaching every day. So I don't want to, 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 <laughs> to lose uh, your time, Delphine. Uh, we will uh, go today for, for this conference, but we have already mentioned that we will have uh, several others. And we will try to, to work also on the other aspect of the, what is now at stage, because we are now discussing the flexibility on the work. Uh, perhaps Delphine, you could help us on dealing with a, a sort of challenge that is in front of us. Uh, we have managed to have a quite important decision on uh, flexibility on work. 
Uh, the occupational rate of our offices, even before the pandemic, was more or less 30% of offices empty, because colleagues are uh, sick, are on missions, whatever. Uh, nowadays, it's much more. So it's true that we, we cannot return to have, uh, at the same time, full flexibility at the same structure of our office. But what we are challenging is the idea that the price to be paid for the flexibility is to go on a very full open space without taking into account of what the colleagues are doing, the jobs that they are doing, uh, without no consultation whatsoever, as it was sort of destiny from which we cannot escape. And we are convinced it is not. And we would like also to have a European opinion on this respect. So thank you very much for being with us. And the floor is yours, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for this invitation to discuss about uh, flex office and hot desking. So as said, my name is Delphine Minkala. I'm a permanent lecturer and researcher at L'OM Normandie Business School. And uh, so I'm going to share my uh, PowerPoint document for this pre presentation of today. And I think that it is best for me to switch off my camera to make sure that I keep um, a good connection uh, if I'm able to do so. I'm trying. Uh, no, it was not this way. So first I should stop here and then share my screen. That's it. Um, is it okay for, for everyone? Yeah, you all can. Okay. Yeah, that's great. yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. Okay, okay, that's great. So um, yes, indeed. So as said before, I hold one PhD. Uh, well, actually, I got two, but my latest uh, is in organization theory, and it was devoted to the question of organizational spaces. And I defended that uh, thesis in 2015, and I did it for La Société Générale, the high street bank, um, which was um, in order to understand the way space could help um, managerial changes uh, and practices. And since uh, that thesis, I've dedicated most of my research activities to that topic of space, from so uh, space at large, uh, to the different uh, workspace types. Um, so uh, I'm above all interested uh, in the user's perception of space, uh, that's why I often mobilize Henri Lefebvre. I don't know if you know this French philosopher, Henri Lefebvre, and his uh, triptych, um, which is about conceived space, perceived space, and lived space. So the first is conceived space, and it's quite important to understand. So the conceived space is um, the space of the decision makers who most of the time won't have to live in the space they conceive. Uh, this conceived space is highly prescriptive, not to say restrictive, as it as it defines, uh, it is defined according to the way the decision makers want people to work. Uh, to interact and, well, to live at work. Then we have the perceived space, which is about, um, uh, well, which is about one can perceive when he or she enters a space for the first time. Um, that's to say all the possibilities or constraints uh, this space can bear. And finally, the lived space uh, is the space of everyday users, people who, thanks to their daily practices of this space, know all the non-visible dimension of it, uh, the deep sense it conveys, its history, the social rituals that come to life there. So this uh, theoretical framework that you have on your screen of conceived, perceived, and lived space is very often used by researchers uh, to understand the dialectical relationship between humans and their environment. Um, it's also important uh, to mention that I've studied space from a corporate real estate point of view uh, to understand how workspace types, 
are designed and the consequences it may have on uh, people at work in terms of performance, health and interactions. Um, so I've recently published two books on that topic to try to establish a real communication between users and decision makers. And um, as you mentioned, it, my last academic article was dedicated to the concept and manifestations of special justice and so injustice and special privileges, which is uh, what you've been talking about in the organizational space. So from, from what I've understood about the situation you're facing today regarding the space organization you're working in, uh, well, I felt convenient for a first um, meeting uh, to come back with the concept of uh, non-territorial offices themselves and to, light, to highlight why the, what the scientific and academic literature say about their advantages and disadvantages from an organizational, but above all, from a human point of view. Uh, then I've um, offered for a second meeting that we could pay attention to the consequences of working in an open environment, as I've understood that it was your environment of work, uh, with a particular focus on the noises, consequences on people's health and well-being. Uh, of course, um, when I mentioned the scientific and academic literatures, I think about uh, medicine, paramedics, and also um, psychological and ergonomic um, literatures. And uh, finally, uh, a third conference will be devoted to spaces impacts on performance and social relations at work, and especially informal uh, relations, and this from a job-related point of view. Um, so, of course, uh, all the information I'm going to put forward during this communication is either uh, based on my academic, academic readings in different fields or um, uh, extracted from my unpublished research or in the, in the process of being published. In all cases, references are provided, as you will see. So, uh, let's start. Um, so, as an introduction, I thought convenient uh, to define um, the vocabulary we use, because you will soon understand that this point is far from being anecdotal. Well, according to an article published in uh, 2016 in Facilities, uh, the review, um, the proper definition of hot desking is, I quote, a method of office resource management designed to reduce the real estate costs of professional practices. And to do so, uh, management replaced traditional territorial working, that is to say where specific desks were located to specific employees, with an allocation system whereby these who attend um, the office on a specific day are given a free desk or to take free desk uh, from a pool. Um, another definition of hot desking from the literature refers to the situation in which staff have no fixed personal workspace and use any available desk as needed. And a bit further, the author underlines that hot desking is frequently promoted and reinforced by office etiquette, which include clear desk policies aiming uh, to keep offices free of stuff that clutters and impedes adaptation. So, um, obviously, from these two definitions of hot desk, we easily understand that there is actually uh, no difference, uh, no concrete difference with flex office and hot desks. Both are about not having a personal desk at work. So, um, Hot desk, nomadism, clean desk, dynamic environment, and an even more recent uh, expression, regenerating environment, all refer to the same mechanism. It's just that these expressions will simply put a specific emphasis on a certain aspect of the phenomenon. For instance, 
clean desk refers to the fact that after you day of work, you're supposed to leave a clean surface deprived of all personal belongings to make sure that someone else will be able to use the same desk the day after you without any feeling of discomfort. Still, when adapting these non-territorial desk solutions, organization often choose a different name instead of flex surface. Okay, and um, actually we have no scientific explanation for uh, for that. Um, well, one hypothesis uh, is that um, the, the the expression flex surface has uh, not a very, very good image among the public, and maybe uh, hot desking or um, regenerating environment sounds better. I don't know. So. But what is really very important to understand is that flex offices and hot desking are about workspace management, okay? Whereas um, private uh, office or shared offices or small or medium or large open plans refer to a specific material dimensions, you see? So it's not different at all. And, um, so basically, it means that a private office can be managed as a, a non-territorial office, that's to say a flex office or a hot desk, as well as there are some large open plans that are only organized with personally assigned desks. Therefore, it means that beyond the mere definition of non-territorial offices, flex office or hot desk can be adapted in very different ways um, with more or less acceptance from the users. So now let's deal with the uh, advantage uh, that are uh, identified in the academic literature. So the first uh, advantage you'll hear about is the reduction of financial costs, obviously. And this financial argument is always um, one of the main inputs to a flex office or a hot desk project. So we know that all organizations are constantly searching for all methods to decrease the cost. And we know that space constitutes the second largest expense after salaries. So these, uh, those expenses are divided, as you can see, uh, into three categories. Uh, the first one um, is about the premises, rental or purchase, and the taxes. Then you have the, all the necessary facility services like cleaning and aseptization, technical maintenance, company reception, food services, um, security, and finally, you have air conditioning, water, heating, energies at large. So, uh, reducing uh, the organizational space square meters is the best way to reduce those special related costs. And um, to reduce uh, those square meters, there are basically two possibilities. First, to get rid of all partitions, all wall partitions separating workers' desks. And the second is to adapt non-territorial desks because it allows to have much less desk than you have employees, thanks to on-site on -site staff rotation, obviously. So, of course, both, as you know, both solutions can be combined to maximize the, the cost reductions. That's to say non-territorial um, non territorial desk in, uh, in a large open plant. But of course, as you can see uh, on your screen, if you do so, um, if you put these two options together, you also combine their disadvantages. As you can see uh, on this scheme, um, which is actually an extract from an academic publication we are submitting at the moment, so you, you keep it for you. And, um, and this uh, scheme uh, summarizes all the drawbacks uh, that we have found with my colleagues uh, Giselle Campos de Ribeiro and Elena Carialenen, um, all the drawbacks that we have found in, um, in the literature. Uh, so you see, um, 
from the left to the right, you have uh, all the different uh, workspace types from individual office to large open plan. And uh, from the top to the bottom, you have non-territorial offices like clean desk, hot desk, flex office to personally and permanently assigned desk, uh, that's to say, well, a, a permanent uh, desk. And so if you're really looking for uh, some kind of um, uh, reduction in terms of financial cost, therefore you will combine non-territorial and large open plan. And, and so that's it. So you will have no territorialization. Well, at least this territorialization, that is to say the personalization of your workplace, won't be allowed, even though you will see some managers or um, powerful people, I would say, in the organization uh, will, will uh, defy authority in order to resettle uh, in a permanent place. Um, you have less working dynamics and rituals, but we will uh, talk about it a bit later. Um, you will have also um, health issues, um, headaches most of the time, uh, but also um, uh, the viruses will be spread more uh, directly in large open plan. You will have difficulty to focus because of the noise. This is really related. Uh, lack of privacy, and this is not inclusive. It has been proven not inclusive large open plans. Why that? Simply because hearing impaired people um, suffer uh, much more uh, in this kind of environment as um, as uh, normal hearing people. So, and you see, I put a reference uh, at the bottom of the scheme, uh, Richardson, and uh, this is a reference uh, for a literature review that summarizes all those drawbacks. So, uh, very concretely, the key driver of the initial application of hot desking is that office sizes could be reduced up to 30%, um, depending on the tendency of the business to, for instance, visit clients or uh, the collaborator being outside the premises for, for, for working days. Um, for instance. So from that perspective, we understand one thing is that organizations above all think in terms of a square meter occupancy rate in relation to what it globally costs. Okay, so as for the second argument, um, well, it is said to be uh, more eco-friendly. Well, so this is related to the environment, and we often read that these non-territorial spaces are more eco-friendly because you have less square meters, that's it. Um, so less square meters to heat, to clean, and so on, and therefore you spare resources. So the less square meters, the more eco-friendly. Still, one must be very careful because for those two arguments, um, the cost reduction and the eco-friendly approach, the literature has shown that sometimes non-territorial projects do not actually reduce surface areas. And instead of personal desk, um, organizations tend to develop other kinds of collective spaces uh, based on a multiplicity of uses with a concern for the so-called um, user satisfaction. But very concretely, the reinvestment in such collective spaces uh, are not certain at all. So, um, so that's it, okay? Um, the third argument uh, is that hot desking uh, is more adapted to today's work. Um, so, the conceptualization of the flex office uh, is the work of two Harvard professors, Stone and Lucchetti, in their book entitled Your Work is Where You Are, Your Office is Where You Are, um, which was published in 1985. Um, because, well, the 1990s, in the 1990s, the um, and driven by the digitalization of work, the new ways of working, that, that's the expression, you know, promoted a high degree of flexibility, and they are understood as a possibility for an employee to choose 
where, when, and how they wish to carry out their assignments. And at the same time, in this period, the office building um, um, started to become more digital, and the office was uh, becoming, uh, you know, the computer instead of the desk. Um, and finally, the last advantage, with, which is actually more uh, transition toward the disadvantages of the system rather than a proper advantage, is that this non-territorial space management is supposed to enhance communication and group dynamic. And um, this argument you will see is very frequently put forward by organizations when they implement uh, this kind of workspace management, yet it has not been proven scientifically. On the contrary, um, a recent study based on a cognitive performance measurement approach showed that the cognitive overload generated by the implementation of uh, the non-territorial offices, I quote, led to a decrease in performance. Um, this hyperstimulation is also accompanied by a decrease in movement despite the promise of a dynamic environment. And so this study ultimately indicates that the economic gains associated with the redesign of uh, workspaces are counterbalanced by a decrease in performance objectively measured by the cognitive approach. Um, so that's the, and it was published in 2018. Um, so now let's uh, move up to the disadvantages. So first disadvantage is that just just like I said before, uh, it is not efficient. Um, not efficient because some studies, quantitative as well as qualitative, uh, have pointed out the fact that people tend to resettle into a uh, stable special arrangement. It is also true for managers, uh, even though as such they are supposed to promote special mobility uh, in a hot desking system. Uh, as we can see in the study led by uh, Denis and Pascal in um, 2017, in which people, uh, in which in the study um, we, we really saw people clearly express the need to have a personal uh, localization uh, within the organizational space. And uh, to put it in a nutshell, people reclaim their ownership of spaces by personalizing it. Uh, well, um, to personalize is to territorialize, okay? So um, the second um, disadvantage is that by implementing non-territorial desks, the organization loses working synergies. And this has been, has been proven. Uh, indeed, um, in, a non, in a territorial working system, the traditional working system, team members are assigned desks in close proximity to one another in order to enable ease and um, regular collaboration and discussion between individuals working on similar projects and uh, similar themes. But when desks are assigned randomly, uh, this is lost uh, because you no longer know where your colleagues are located, not even for the day. Um, the third argument um, against non-territorial arrangement points out the fact that colleagues lose their everyday routine and uh, rituals. And indeed, several studies focus on disruption of everyday special routines and patterns of proximity. And uh, these studies suggest that hot desking can give rise to a lack of informal social relations and the potential uh, for loneliness and isolation of the work. Uh, one, may, one must really pay a great attention to that point because if people stop ritualizing their working environment, it will soon what um, it will soon become what Marc Roger calls a non-place. That's to say, a meaningless space with that strong symbolic dimension, no attachment from people anymore, because at the end of the day, they are just passing through 
uh, they don't belong to it anymore. So to become a non-place is really bad for the organization because people stop um, uh, to emotionally invest in it and there is no appropriation anymore. And so nothing distinguishes this space from any other public space. So this is a, a, a real loss for the organization. Um, the fourth uh, disadvantage uh, identified by the academic literature is that with this non-territorial system, um, people are not supposed to um, personalize uh, the environment. So we know uh, as a comparison that in a territorial working system, um, we are encouraged uh, to build and to adapt our desk to our um, own personal preferences and working ideals, okay? But with a hot desking, um, it is lost, and uh, it will be really wrong to consider that personalization of our workplace is superficial, as um, we know now today that it is, it is deeply related to our feeling of belonging to the organization, and it's enhancing our engagement to it. Um, as First point in um, 2011, the removal of personalization and locational identity undermine any rhetoric of commitment. And this point is really very important to understand because this loss of opportunity to territorialize, ter territorialize sorry, your own desk in your organization can lead to behaviors of resistance. So it does not mean that people will, will work less. It means that they'll do what it takes to be uh, not to be in danger professionally. Basically, they'll do their job, but nothing more. They will no longer adhere to the institutional discourse anymore because this loss of personal desk will be lived as some kind of additional distance between the organization and the employees. Um, Moreover, this question of offices personalization shows that people need to express their identities and initiate and maintain relationships using personal artifacts. Um, so, for instance, Goffman in 1971 uh, pointed out that I put the personal possessions of an individual are an important part of the materials that of which it builds a self. So this personalization is highly related to our identity at work, and that's why it is so meaningful to us. So to complete these disadvantages and to dive into my own experience as a researcher when I was writing my book related to the flex office system um, uh, in 2020, well, there are also many quite practical difficulties when choosing uh, non-territorial offices. So, for instance, um, I was able to uh, interview someone working in a non-territorial yet private offices environment and our two managers devoted two working days a month to choose who will go in what office because some rooms were supposed to be much better than others because of a window or because of a larger desk. And despite all their efforts, these two managers received a lot of complaints because most employees said that they were mistreated. Um, in uh, another company, the headquarters of an international company, a French subsidiary, in fact, it was almost impossible to find a free desk if you arrive after a outdoor meeting, for instance, which was pretty common in their activity. So people started to book meeting rooms with a fake agenda a place uh, where to work instead of working sit on a chair with your computer on your lap and so at the end of the day uh, there was no meeting room available at all um, another uh, big company um, well in another big company they wanted people to book their desk uh, for the day when they were coming to the office so to do so, they created an application on which each morning you had to connect on your mobile to see if there was any desk left, well, to book it. But the people I interviewed about that booking system told me that 
they had the feeling of being spied on by their company all the more because if someone shows the same location for a couple of days it would receive an, an uh, automatic uh, email from the hr department asking asking him or her uh, to play the game of the i quote special mobility um I, I uh, also interviewed people working in a non-territorial large open plan and uh, they told me that they had the feeling of working in a public library. Uh, this is a quotation in the verbatim. Uh, as people uh, didn't greet each other anymore, as they knew that in this kind of environment, uh, they, they had to be silent. Therefore, when they arrived, they put their computer on the table. They didn't pay attention to their neighbors anymore because they don't know if they know the, the, those neighbors. And uh, it was just like the experience was just like in a public place. It was exactly uh, the manifestation of what uh, Marc Auger calls a non-place. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, the only testimony of a happy non-territorial desk user I succeeded to get was quite singular. Still, I think it's uh, inter interesting to mention it. Um, well, uh, all the IT uh, company uh, my, my interviewee was working in was organized in a non-territorial desk, but within department's territory. So it means that she and her 20 colleagues from the marketing department shared the same surface in which no personal, uh, no personal workspace was attributed, but uh, there were there was uh, there were sorry as much options to sit and work as there were people working in that department. Therefore, uh, there was no need to book anything at all. And because this area was um, uh, enclosed um, and always frequented by the same team, that they knew each other quite well, trusted each other to the extent that they could let their wallet or their mobile on the table without risking anything. They had the right also to um, uh, personalize their zone, which was a nice place with a small kitchen in it. So she appreciated this non-territorial territory uh, because it gave her the possibility to work close to her um, top manager of the department to show him that she was really dedicated to her mission. And, uh, and uh, she told me that she believed that in a more traditional organization, she would never get the opportunity to interact uh, with him on a daily basis. Well, um, as a conclusion, I would say that, uh, well, it's easy and superficial to reduce people's personal workspace to a financial cost only, uh, because what the organization loses in terms of employee performance and this was measured. Involvement, innovation, because innovation is directly related to people's informal exchanges. And uh, employees' well being should also need to be considered. Uh, let's not forget that, that the place you are given when you accept to work for a company is somehow the materialization of the symbolic contract you share together. Um, so, as, as I said, um, this non-territorial uh, solution has many drawbacks, but um, this management of space might work if, um, well, um, it might work if uh, the future users are involved and questioned about their, their workspace they'd like to work in. Project teams should be organized and um, and th those project teams should be organized for two things, basically. First, uh, to clearly define uh, people's needs in terms of special resources like storages, meeting rooms and so on, and also needs on special proximity as some departments should be closer to uh, others as they also need to interact. Um, also, um, you have to uh, avoid large open plans. Why that? Because non-territorial uh, hot desk is already complicated to set up. It is not necessary to add more problems. So, 
So to organize non-territorial offices inside the department's territory appears to be quite an acceptable solution from what I heard from the field. Um, then make sure that there are uh, the special conditions to make informal interactions happen. So um, about those uh, informal interactions, we know thanks to the um, architecture literature that a certain amount of centrality, functional and geographical centrality, and privacy, that is to say, to be able to control your surroundings, to see who's coming uh, and to make sure that you're not overheard, um, are respected. These two dimension, uh, dimensions, special dimensions of uh, centrality and privacy are really very important. Um, still, it's, it's quite difficult to have privacy in an open plan. Uh, then, um, well, uh, people's health should also be considered, as I said, to that purpose, the activity-based working system where you can find a variety of different settings, uh, allowing, allowing the users to change their locations several times a day is a solution to fight, for instance, sedentary habits. And it has been proven to be um, to be really bad for people's health. Um, then, uh, of course, some kind of collective personalization of the uh, new place should be encouraged, as appropriation is a critical issue. We know that it has been proven. So, uh, so it means that people should be given a means to express their identity and their preferences in terms of comfort uh, in order to feel truly welcome at, at work. And, um, and well, if, well, um, in, the, in the case of losing your personal desk in your organization, then uh, you should be given something back. What I mean is that, um, uh, for instance, there's an organization I know who offered an, one extra day of telework per week in exchange of the hot desking system, and it really changed uh, people's perception because they understood that they had something to gain in return. See, so uh, this uh, one extra day of telework is not necessarily the solution. Um, maybe something else could be um, negotiated. Um, also, avoid special injustice. So, funny, you've been talking about it. So, avoid special injustice and special privileges. Uh, everybody should be treated the same simply because if it's not, then it will um, it will obviously um, create um, well uh, resistance at work. And as I said before, resistance at work does not mean that people will stop working. It means that they will no longer adhere uh, to the institution. Um, vision and discourse, and that's that's really very bad for the organization. And um, finally, uh, one needs to understand that what is at stake uh, if people stop to come to their office to work is the loss of the organizational culture. So it means that you know all the codes, all the rights that uh, that make. Um, the organizational culture is transmitted to the newcomers through imitations. That's to, that's to say that if you remember on your first day what you did uh, when you first uh, entered a company to work, you uh, pay great attention to people's behavior, the way they interact together, the way they speak together, and so on and so on, and you try to imitate them in order to be integrated, okay? So this is the um, organizational culture. And uh, from the moment that people no longer come to their, um, uh, well, uh, organizational premises, there is no possibility to maintain this organizational culture. Therefore, it means that the work will still be done, but um, there is no organization see, anymore. So, so that's it. Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm stopping my um, PTT. That's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very, very much for your very interesting 
uh, conference. Uh, I think that we have we could have started from there before putting in place everything as is the case today, because it's always easier to start on good track and then to to go on the same that to 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 start wrongly and then to redress, especially when it comes to deal with buildings, they are not that flexible. <clears throat> I think that even uh, looking at the, at the chat, I mean, the colleagues have really understood what we were discussing today. We want really to avoid this uh, sort of uh, parody that we are against everything. We, we just reject everything. We want to have uh, everything. We want to go always on telework, uh, still keeping our own office uh, without for forgetting that the office is our cost and they are taxpayer money. So we have been always reasonable, but what is now at stage is to redress uh, something that has been uh, wrongly made. Uh, your conclusion are uh, more or less the same that uh, the CCP, the CPTT, the Staff and Health Committee are uh, preparing. Uh, and I think that the, the administration is uh, more or less now in favor of uh, adapting the strategy because the full open space has already been considered to be totally unacceptable um, just in order to to provide you with some information about uh, how big the bricolage is uh, the pilot project that has been organized is a tower of 25 floors for almost 2000 colleagues that is the pilot project uh, and then after a few months, uh, they came with what they call uh, uh, evaluation after uh, 100 days. They are much more than 100. Uh, and it's clear that now to change the, the management of a, such a big building, of a, such a big, enormous towers, and to, to take that into account uh, is not that easy. It's quite complicated. And if you consider that the first services who has decided to go there is exactly the administration who is dealing with the confidential files who need to go for a private conversation with the staff and everyone is doing that now in the open space uh, it's just the measure of how crazy was the first approach and thirdly they have started with the building policies and only after starting the negotiation and the flexibility. So the compensation that is part of the, of the package has been negotiated under the pressure of the building policies already decided. Even worse, not all the uh, services are today on open space. So what is now at stake is that the DGs, that they have still the former private offices, are resisting to the flexibility because they don't want to pay the price for losing their offices. So even if they are really keen on providing telework, they are spreading the message to their staff, be aware that if you don't go to the office, you, you lose the, the office. Uh, and then all the uh, new culture of uh, trust and flexibility is just uh, put in, in question by this uh, building policies that is the, uh, the elephant and the salle on the left. Okay, so now um, what we are going to do is to redress and that your help is really needed uh, because we are really glad to see that your conclusion, that are your own conclusion are exactly our own conclusion, especially for, for the question of uh, same treatment, if you want to get uh, for the same culture, uh, to avoid that no one is going to the office, uh, because it's also part of our concerns. I mean, we know that the staff uh, really love and deserve the telework flexibility, but still, we want to go to the office somewhere and somehow uh, our flexibility in this respect is really uh, very very high because the, the question is not per day is more on part of your time so uh, we are entitled to go to the office uh, several hours if there are meetings and to come uh, at home for telework it's clear that it's uh, more virtual for those who are to commute i see one colleague mentioning that the most effective part of the day is when she teleworks on the train coming to Brussels. Uh, we we are all really even um, very strict on the right to disconnect because the risk of the teleworking every day is also that you get messages that um, uh, whatever <clears throat> moment, even the night, we, we really want to have a right to disconnection. 
Um, so it's much work to be done. Uh, would have been much more effective to start on the good runs than to redress mistakes. But what can we do? We live with what we have. Uh, the political pressure on uh, reducing budget is enormous. Um, and the budget is, uh, in a way, the blackmail for avoiding a new reform of the staff regulations. So if we don't, if we are not able to to live with the budget that we have, uh, the, the the answer will be to start again undermining the conditions of our staff regulation with the with the fact that already the attractiveness of the civil service is very low. We don't we don't manage to recruit uh, staff for several member states. Um, <laughs> could suggest <laughs> yeah i mean there is a one colleague who is uh, uh suggesting uh that you could provide a list of uh, uh literature to our colleagues uh, sure in order to avoid that they can still be stupid and disrespectful <laughs> when we mention something against because it's true that uh, our uh, administration sometimes has the the guts to say that we we don't know the reality we we are totally in our bubble uh, and is exactly the contrary i just go through the question on the chat if there are questions okay. and and colleagues if you have questions to be uh, raised to delphine please do it uh, we have still a few minutes yeah and by the way this is not the references i'm going to give you is the full articles uh, very good very good this is so. more complete yeah and am I really interesting on the one of the director general reserving a big office for themselves, the rest of the staff being on open space? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, okay, so I see that. The, uh, yeah. yeah, there is a, a question from uh, uh, Malgorata, uh, perhaps uh, because it's uh, Dikra who is managed to, to provide the, the floor. Okay, it's okay. Okay, you can speak. Yes, if I may. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I would like first of all to thank you very much for for this presentation. It was actually quite amazing, uh, and uh, I really wish that our management had heard this before <laughs> uh, and of course it confirms all that i know already and i have some experience in working in working of on uh, hot desking and open space plans since um, more than 20 years and it can work if well implemented for a selected consultancy setting but but definitely uh, not here and i would like to add one more thing and ask a question uh, I'm working in the one that's open space. Now think how much more expensive is the heating of the space than individual offices and how much inflex, how much more inflexible, right? If we have smaller offices heated individually, then people can adjust. This is part of, you know, personalization, but in open space, vast empty space needs to be heated so, of course, we save on this, so we underheat it, so it's cold and it's wasted at the same time. Now, my question really is, are there any indications, any measures of how much this really, all this ideas cost? Because OIB, of course, can show uh, how much we saved on the buildings but are there any indicators like on average maybe because i don't think oib would be collecting this how much losses we have in efficiency and all these other uh sort of things if if i wonder if you could yeah if if there is anything and of course if we can have this this presentation somewhere or reach it somewhere or give us more to read please i would very much like that. Thanks. Sure. sure, with pleasure. Um, yes, indeed, we have uh, several very interesting articles and literature review articles, that is to say that they compare all the literature uh, dealing with one aspect of it. So it's very difficult to bring it to a figure. But what we know is that uh, there are much more uh, sick leaves 
for instance, working in an open plan. Uh, we know that we also lose um, uh, in terms of innovation, because we know that innovation comes from the fact that people have informal interactions. So that's the reason why uh, most of organizations try to uh, keep um, uh, informal uh, interactions alive among employees. But um, if you don't uh, succeed in, um, in knowing where your colleagues are and you lose all your rituals, it's very complicated to keep those uh, informal uh, relations at work. So we lose innovation, uh, commitment as well. And I have many, many figures. So that's why I was offering to send um, all uh, the academic articles, um, because you will see that most of them are quantitative studies. So um, basically, we need to put them all together in order to, you know, to uh, make a total of the, of the, the amount. Um, but uh, we have, as I said, sick leave, innovation, informal interaction, uh, people's involvement, well-being, performance, cognitive performance is also measured, and also perceived performance, because there, there are two ways to uh, measure performance, uh, self-assessed performance on the one hand, and cognitive measured on the other, uh, when people are given a difficult task to do in, you know, um, a loud environment as it can be in uh, an open plan. And, uh, and also we have articles about the decrease of uh, relationship uh, at works when we are in a flexible plus uh, open plan environment, uh, because people don't dare anymore talk to each other. Yeah. Very, very good. Um, we have also a question, uh, Delphine, um, coming from Blandin. Uh, we have also the feeling that there is a sort of a generational concern on our desk, in, meaning that young colleagues seems to be more keen on accepting the solution, older colleagues uh, less. Uh, is something on your experience or your studies that will eventually show that there is a different uh, acceptation of open space based on uh, age of births and concerns? Um, um, well, uh, I have an ongoing uh, research at the moment with uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Sabrina Tancrel, and this is a qualitative studies, a study, sorry, and um, and basically this is, a, well, our findings uh, show that it's not related to age, but uh, to the personal uh, life of individuals, and, um, and that's it. But, um, from what we've seen, it, well, people stop uh, losing their interest in the organizational space from the moment that they lose their comfort. You see, so uh, so that's it. So we know that there are people who need to have more social interaction at work, social interaction because they don't have them at home. See, but it's not related to age. But the thing is that before this sanitary crisis that we have all known, um, people used to come at work and have a social life, and there was one, no one was wondering if it was better to stay at home or not. You, you, can you, you, you get me? And so what is funny is that today it seems that some people have chosen that it's okay to uh, come only once in a while at work and they do their job because, uh, you know, it is as if uh, there was some kind of separation between first the work itself and second the organization. As if the work is only the thing uh, for what I'm paid, okay? So my work consists in um, some task that I'm going to do, and the organization is about all the constraints. So for some, it will be about the organization 
are um, a lot of constraints and for the others or the organization offer a lot of resources inter interactions um, social and informal uh, identity social identity and so on so that's it at the end of the day we have the feeling with Sabrina Tonkrel and our findings that uh, there is a true uh, separation of the work and the organization and what we think is that um, you cannot reduce uh, your uh, job activities to mere working tasks. That's it. Yeah. Uh, another thing that we normally experience on, uh, on our um, contact with the services is that on top of the generational aspect, they are also the kind of job that you are carried out. Uh, for example, IT colleagues or scientific colleagues uh, seems to be more familiar with this way of working. Uh, administrative uh, colleagues or uh, lawyer, for example, are uh, really refusing the idea of working in open space because it's totally contrary with their own way to work, uh, most mostly based on concentration. Uh, <clears throat> and that's why it's also important to, to keep on uh, fighting uh, for the respect of the decision, mentioning that uh, the, the kind of job is important and the consultation of the staff is also crucial. Uh, that's why we are fighting for having uh, yeah. something that is now on the chat as a suggestion. It's exactly what you do uh, to provide each and every director general to organize its own space uh, based on the kind of tasks who are uh, made by, by the colleagues. They are under his or her responsibility. Uh, <clears throat> uh, for example, our translator colleagues uh, uh, a really uh, tough time working on open space uh, with, the, with the noise. We are also working on the uh, noise pollution, uh, eventually to organize also a survey on this respect, because it's one of the of the most concern of the colleagues are this uh, bruit de fond, that it makes the life in the office uh, quite painful when it comes, especially to answer to the phone. And if you go to this, uh, the one, you will see colleagues that just doing like this, uh, uh, like if they are shushot the telephone, it's it's really painful. Yeah. Um, and I think that is also part of your experience. I suppose that the kind of job who is carried out is part of the the element for the perception and acceptance of this organization of the work. I suppose. Yes, and also uh, one an uh, another aspect uh, concerned the newcomers of the company, uh, because uh, when the newcomers started, well, this new job, they need to learn. So I mentioned the organizational culture, but of course, well, and, and really the organizational culture is the definition. This is the way we do things here, you see. So this, you know, and so this is so important to keep people together. Otherwise, we do individual tasks, okay, and that's it. So you see, so that's why I said we cannot reduce our job to our working activities. So that's why it's so important to have an organizational life and identity. But uh, what you said about uh, the job related point and also uh, the age gap is well, um, about the newcomers, I have a lot of um, testimonies from a newcomer who wanted to learn more about the organization, how to make sure that um, it is a good way uh, to talk to this person if he's a superior, a supervisor, and so on and so on, you know. And sometimes um, you are qualified, you have a lot of skills, and so on and so on, but there are things that your colleagues need to show you uh, in order to do it properly. And from the moment that they are not here or not here on a regular basis, uh, you are lost, you see. And I and also we, in my research with uh, Sabrina Tancrel, we've seen that um, there was some kind of separation between the newcomers and the ones on the one hand who felt very difficult to um, integrate and the other colleagues who knew very well each other, and so they didn't have to make any effort, and it was so comfortable for them working in telework most of the day and coming uh, from day to day uh, at the organization premises. Yeah, it's already the, the feeling that we have. Um, that's why the Commission is putting forward more the flexibility than the flex office to the newcomers, mentioning that is the flexibility that we can offer. 
And it's true that the young candidates are really interested in uh, this kind of flexibility. Uh, they are even requesting to work uh, on telework from abroad, not even coming to Brussels uh, sometime. Uh, and it is also part of, uh, of the package that the Commission is offering that uh, you are also paid uh, more because you, you have to, to, to go to Brussels to work. If you stay at home, uh, doesn't make any sense uh, anymore to have a, a civil servant, but still uh, we work also on this kind of flexibility that we managed to have a few days of teleworking from abroad to go, to go back to our families, uh, to our holders' families. So it's, it's important also to do that. Uh, I think that we, I don't see any other, and we come at the end of our time. So I can only uh, thank you again, and it's just a, Yes, a rendezvous. We all uh, everything will be put on our website. Even the recording of the conference, all the information provided by Dolphin will be also published, and we will keep on working in order to have your scientific support to our uh, work as a staff representative. And thank you very much. Your conference was really interesting and to the point. Many, many thanks. Many thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you.